what is the artist's stake in the ecology of the world in which neuroscience, politics, philosophy, and aesthetic production all meet? Like, what's our stake? Because we are, hopefully, those of us who are delinked from a purely commercial practice, those of us who really look at art as a way to investigate the world, those of us who look at art as a means for knowledge production, those of us who look at art as a way to make the world a bigger place, to make it more differentiated, to uh, generate more diversity. Okay, so this is one uh, example of a piece that I did in 2006. It says, resistance is futile, resistance is fertile. With these amazing machines uh, that can do good as well as they can do bad, uh, but which can create such a system of, uh, of authority and governmentalization uh, that can actually affect our free will, is how do we resist this? What is the, can we resist it? We, we know now that capitalism um, is, uh, it, it thrives on, on variation. It thrives on artistic production. Artistic production and the creative industries have become one as, as, as uh, labor and uh, performance has, has, has become almost a unified entity. Art before philosophy, not after. What does that mean, art before philosophy? I'm a conceptual artist. And I believe that art before philosophy, not after. And of course, so much of conceptual art as we understand it, and we'll get into a little bit more about conceptual art practice, we'll take a historical position, but we'll also look at what I believe conceptual art means today. So much of it was based on theory and this kind of transduction of theory into practice. Well, I believe that art comes before and that following art, the art mutating the conditions of the, of the um, cultural, aesthetic, political landscape, that philosophy must follow and create new languages for which to understand artist production. This project is called um, Education of the Eye. So in my, in my studio in Berlin, I had originally eight artists come to my studio and I gave them palettes. Like the palette in this in William Hellgrove painting of 1637, a self-portrait where he was painting his own self-portrait. And I had them sit there for three hours. They, they didn't have to sit there for three hours, but they had three hours. And I asked them to sit there and match all the colors they could possibly see in the painting onto these palettes that I gave them, uh, given them. Here's another example. Here's another example. Here are all the paints that I gave them. It was like, it was like a Solowit rule-based work, but in Solowit, the difference between this kind of early conceptual practice and my practice was that in Solowit, each the rules that Solowit gave were like a cybernetic rule. The rule made the work. Okay, so then I went to Los Angeles and I thought, okay, I'm not even going to do painting. I'm just going to use these color aids, which are these devices that artists use to match colors. I'll use this box. And here's an artist doing the same. Uh, he's looking at the painting. I don't have a picture of the painting, but he's looking at the painting and he's doing the test. And then here, the same, the same exact thing that happened. We have, um, these are the ones with the, the analytic method. We still have very differences in how many colors everyone saw. And here's uh, Jacob von Ruesdale uh, uh, rainbow. And in this rainbow, there's very little, just white and black, uh, some yellow. And here's a Millet rainbow, double rainbow. And again, the colors are wrong. These are all wrong rainbows. They're not colored, even though by this time, when Millet painted this painting, he knew already what the proper colors of the rainbow were. He chose not to use those colors. Why? That's, that's why I was interested. So I made these rainbow brushes. These are brushes that were made by uh, putting those colors from the Millet painting, those two rainbows, putting, matching the colors onto a piece of paper, pulling the rainbow brush through the paper. And then here's another one. And then here's three rainbow brushes in a museum. And then here's the wrong rainbow paintings, which is based on the same. And now what I'm doing is I'm taking uh, the wrong rainbow color. This is from a, a, a rainbow that's wrong. And uh, the background is from the color of the sky and back of the rainbow. And then I have this squeegee that I'm using to now put the color on the canvas, cutting a hole in the canvas and putting black velvet behind it. It's now looking like an iris 
It looks like an eye and an iris. And when you look at this painting, you can't tell this because it's not real. It's a draw. It's a picture. But when you look into that black depth, you cannot focus on the work. You cannot. It's just the truth. So you have. So this is where these have come. Here's another one. This is another piece of mine. Uh, this is based on. It's called In the Infinite Replay of One's Own Self Destruction, and it's a. Um, it's a, a sound work. I'm going to just give you a little background. So there are always two pairs to a speaker. I'm looking at them like brothers or sisters or twins or lovers. And I destroy one of them. And in the process of destroying it, I record it. And then I put it, and then I take this analog speaker and I digitally reconstruct it and put an SD card in it. And it plays the, uh, the sound of the destruction of its mate. project, I started in about 2008, and what it was was that I started meeting artists, and it was a way of meeting artists as a kind of, a way of, uh, a kind of interview, almost a, a way of interviewing other artists, and basically I invited them to bring three objects with them that they felt close to, then we talked about those three objects, then we, I asked them to close their eyes and imagine an exhibition space, and then I invited them to together collaboratively with me to make an imaginary exhibition in their mind's eye, and that was it. Then I started doing it in museums and galleries and it, uh, over and over again. And finally at, at the school of uh, the SciArcs, uh, Southern California Institute of Architecture, they invited me to come for 14 weeks in which I did this thing called the uh, University Without Walls. And I did four different projects, one of which was the mind's eye. Okay, so therefore at this particular point, I had only had these imaginary exhibitions. I never, I was only dealing with this immateriality. But then one day, uh, I started thinking about it in a different way. And I said to the students before I arrived, I want you to go up to the Schindler House. It's a beautiful house built in 1922 uh, in West Hollywood. And I want you to go up there. I want you to choose a room at the Schindler House for you to be able to make your imaginary exhibition in your mind's eye in. So they all trepsed up there. They all came back to the school. They all chose their room. They closed their eyes and we first talked about the objects, and then what happened was that each of them made an imaginary exhibition in, the, in one of the rooms of the Schindler House that they remembered. Okay. Then about a week later, they came in, and lo and behold, I said to them, okay, you remember the exhibition in your mind's eye that you did? Well, now I want you to build a model of it. So, here's the setup, and here's the Schindler House. Again, the setup. And then, I, then each of them were able to build a model. So they, these immaterial exhibitions, which were supposedly just immaterial, this performative in the in knowledge economy, had actually left traces in the brain's neural networks so that they could be called up from their long-term memory, brought back into, into this memory, and be able to make, an, uh, make uh, you know, something real.